Welcome to AccuWeather's Ask the Experts. I'm your host, Jeff Cornish. Whether you nerd out on it or want to know more about it, we talk to some of the best minds in meteorology, space, and science to get answers on everything you've wanted to ask. And today we're going to talk about weather and flying, not just any type of flying, but specialized flying that our nation's military pilots undertake to help keep us safe and the type of flying and air battles that uh, were brought to our attention by the 1986 hit film Top Gun, which has had some new life in recent years in Hollywood as well. So joining us as our expert and to give us insight into what's, it's, what it's really like up there is a real-life Top Gun pilot, Commander John Pico. And Commander Pico, thank you so much for your service and also for making some time for us today. Jeff, it's an honor to be on here with you. Thanks for well, having me. Well, it's an honor to speak with you. We think that what you do is really fascinating. What you've done is really fascinating. So we want to go back to what got you into the cockpit of a fighter jet. Some can trace their passion to the iconic Top Gun movie. How about you? <clears throat> well, that's it. You hit it. In 1986, I was uh, 15 years old and uh, at an all-boys school, pretty naive, and uh, had a had a hot date coming up here and didn't know what to do. And a buddy of mine said, hey, there's this new movie that just came out called Top Gun. Go fast forward through the uh, movie to get to the blue scene where they kiss and that'll help that'll answer questions on how to kiss this gal <laughs> so i get the movie rent it from you know, the vhs have no idea where the blue scene was and so i watched the whole uh the whole movie and i ended up watching it about six times uh the date went horribly wrong but uh, that was the end of that i was like whatever those guys are doing i want to do that <laughs> well, uh, sometimes there's there's kind of a gap between reality and Hollywood. Sometimes Hollywood nails it. So do the Top Gun movies capture what it's really like to fly and maneuver these amazing aircrafts? I'd say in general they do. I think the second movie, the technology producing the movie was far more advanced. They had the cameras in the cockpit and you actually saw aircraft flying. Uh, the first movie did did a good job, but this new new one did a great job. So all the flying you see uh, was authentic in the mountains, in the snow, uh, all that sort of stuff. So uh, that was very, very not just similar. That that is what it's like. And you probably have some pretty good insight. That, you know, I have a, a generic sense that this stuff is awesome. It's fascinating. But what is it about these planes and the elite pilots who fly them that uh, draws us in as the public? And what's so fascinating to us about this? I think it's uh, I think it's a little bit of the unknown, and it's considered probably on the edge of extreme, you know, extreme sports, and and that what that's what people are into these days, and and for for the longest time, uh, you know, it's it's hard for people to understand that uh, at one moment the weight of your head is twenty pounds, and in the next millisecond it's one hundred and sixty pounds while you're in a dogfight, and and that sort of thing that you see captured in some of these movies just bottles people's minds and uh and to do it you know every day it becomes sort of normal it's your job and you forget that not everyone understands what it takes and and the effort and the physicality and the training um so it's shows like this i, I do appreciate the opportunity to, to share some of that with with your viewers absolutely well, we're going to go back and talk about the history of the top gun program uh and uh, did this ultimately come from air tactics in the vietnam war it did. It did. Back then, I mean, we're always assessing uh, any time our country, uh, and frankly, any countries in, in, in a combat situation, I imagine there's some real time and, and afterwards assessment of how we've done. And we had some relatively advanced aircraft and weaponry in Vietnam, and yet we were still taking uh, well higher numbers of losses than I think we should have. Not what I thought, but that's what the country was thinking and decided at that point that it, we, we were going to focus on the tactics and the uh, pilot training. And so in 1969, Top Gun was was born, and, and that is uh, where really it all started. And what is the training actually like? How long does it take to become a Top Gun pilot? Uh, and also, what physical qualifications must somebody have if they want to pursue this? So to be a Top Gun, you don't join the Navy and become a Top Gun pilot. You have a lot to do between uh, joining the Navy and uh, and even getting to that opportunity. Uh, you have to first learn uh, all types of academics. Meteorology is one of our first courses. You'll be happy to know um, aerodynamics, all types of all types of courses before you can even touch an airplane. Then you fly and train in two to three different types of airplanes, making your way eventually 
to ideally to the you know one of the latest greatest fighter airplanes that the navy has go through your first entire squadron and based on how you do in that squadron tactically and as a leader you may be um, recommended to apply to top gun and at that point if you're accepted top gun school is a is you know two to three months long or so with dedicated training uh it used to be in miramar california Years ago, it moved to Fallon, Nevada, and uh, but yeah, after a number of months and and some grueling uh, academic and flight training, uh, you will hopefully graduate as a as a Top Gun pilot. And you hinted at some of the weather training, meteorological training that uh, Top Gun pilots go through. So weather conditions obviously are crucial to every aspect of any military operation. Uh, these are expensive, high price, very valuable aircraft, and there could be some significant danger in the skies. Uh, so uh, what level of weather knowledge is required for a Top Gun pilot? How, dig, how deep do you guys uh, dig into the, the, the weather textbooks? The weather is critical. Now, we have, uh, we have experts, we have meteorologists on our team, on our staff, assigned to the ship that work with the squadron pilots uh, that are very, very capable, not just in the takeoff weather, taking off off the aircraft carrier in the sea states, and the actual weather, but the weather we're going to experience in route where we may need to get air to air refueling from behind another airplane uh, and the weather affects that mission. And then the weather in the target area, uh, which may be in a different country or if we're doing training in our own country, what the weather is like there and then actually what the weather is like at the actual physical target, what shadows we're going to see, any type of you know sandstorms or whatever. And so they're all over that. So we have trained um, meteorologists on staff to help us with that. But weather is discussed in the beginning of the flight, throughout the flight, and at the very end of the flight, for sure. And Commander Pico, we have a viewer question for you. This one comes from April in Washington, D.C. So April writes, in the Top Gun movies, fighter pilots have great nicknames. Uh, we had Goose and others. So uh, do you have a nickname? And uh, what was the story behind it, if so? April, great question. One we get often, and, and I just need to say right off the bat, that call signs are earned and not created by the pilot, because they would be a lot cooler, uh, like Maverick, if uh, if we got to pick our own. So you get those earned and usually not by doing something great. So um, a lot of call signs as well are based on the name. So for example, my last name is Pico. The call sign is Roscoe. Again, my squadron picked it, and they they thought Roscoe and Pico sounded like Roscoe P. Coltrane. So that's where that one came from. But, but there's a bunch of other uh, great call signs. Some are super funny. Some are very inappropriate that we can't discuss here. Uh, but great friends of mine, Voodoo. Uh, there's one guy, Brett Odom, call sign Scro. There's, uh, there's Norm. There's Stinky. There's I mean, it just goes on and on. So uh, that is a great question when you meet a pilot in the Navy uh, or Air Force, ask them their call sign and the story behind it. Real basic question for you, uh, for somebody on the outside, they may assume all oh, airplanes might be in the Air Force. Clearly not the case. So how does that work? What's the delineation between a fighter jet pilot with the Navy as opposed to the Air Force? Common question I get, and uh, and you're right. The, the Air Force has fighter pilots. The Navy has fighter pilots. We both have incredible uh, airplanes and, and weaponry uh, and, and pilots and training, but the, the main difference, so there's a bunch of differences, but the main difference is that Air Force takes off and lands on runways, hard surfaces, and the Navy takes off and lands on aircraft carriers. And so that's the main difference. We don't necessarily need to coordinate a runway where there's an area of concern. We will take the runway to the area of concern and address it as needed. Well, what are some things pilots like yourself are looking for when preparing a mission? So the probably the two or three most important things, weather being right at the top, because uh, it, it, we're going to have to deal with it one way or the other, and it, it could can, you know, potentially be a showstopper. Uh, we may have to change weapons depending on what weather we're going to deal with in the target area. Um, but also the, um, it's called operational risk management. We're going to look at how risky is this mission? How much risk are we taking on with the weather conditions or the sea state or the fact that we've been up for the last 18 hours planning for this? What risk level are we willing to accept? And certain targets, 
certain missions require a much higher level of risk acceptance. And so we'll go through all that and then really get into the nit noise, really get into the weeds of what it's going to take to be successful in this mission. Well, John, this is great stuff so far. We look forward to talking with you more after the break. So coming up later in WeatherWise, we're going to explore some firsts in military flying. This includes the story behind the world's first military airplane. But up next, John will talk about the most challenging weather to fly in. We're also going to be answering more of your weather questions when Ask the Experts continues. Welcome back to AccuWeather's Ask the Experts. I'm your host, Jeff Cornish. In today's show, we are talking with retired Top Gun pilot Commander John Pico, and uh, we're getting insight in what it's like to train and be and to fly as an aviator fighting pilot, and uh, also uh, how weather interacts with their duties. So we're going to talk more about your career as a whole. How many missions did you fly as a military pilot for our country? So we, we uh, count missions that are flown in combat, though that's right around 80. And we also count uh, times we've landed and stopped on aircraft carriers, and that's up around, probably around, you know, eight, eight, nine, nine hundred. And we also count hours, and that's around 3,000. So those are kind of the three things we keep track of. But the 80 combat missions, those are the ones that, that are near and dear to our heart. That's a long time. And just for perspective, a 2,000 hour uh, work year would be uh, if you worked, uh, you know, about 50 hours a week, eight hour days. So that's a lot of time uh, in the air, 3,000 hours. Uh, pretty impressive stuff. Over time, as the jets became more sophisticated with technology, did you have a favorite type of jet to fly? And was it one of the earlier ones or one of the more recent ones? You know, I had some great airplanes to train, train in. Uh, leading up to my eventual airplane, which the, is the FA-18 Hornet, followed afterwards called uh, by the Super Hornet. And so I'm what you call a Hornet baby. So I was in the Hornet and the Super Hornet my entire career, and and by far my favorite airplane, just because I knew how to how to fly it and handle it. Uh, but there are a lot of amazing airplanes out there. I mean the F-22 Raptor, and, and I mean they're in, in our in our. Uh, our allies and, and partners have amazing airplanes as well. So yeah, I would I would have loved the opportunity to fly a bunch of different things, but uh, I was the F-18 guy. That's really cool. Well, can you tell us about any uh, stories when the weather played a negative role? And what are the, some of the worst types of weather uh, that we can think of uh, in terms of negative uh, uh, negatives that impact your missions? So my mom's probably watching, so I have to be careful on telling too many scary <laughs> stories, but uh, the, the weather, has had a dramatic impact in the negative side on some of these missions. In fact, some of my uh, closest friends have, have passed away due to weather-related incidents, uh, fog or sandstorms or sea state. A lot of people forget we're on an aircraft carrier and we got to take off and land at the beginning and end of the mission. And the sea state can be so nasty out there, as as uh, as people may may know. So. Um, those sandstorms as well, people think happen just on land, but it goes right across the uh, the water as well. And of course, thunderstorms and and uh, and snow and blizzard conditions. And one in particular, I recall, I was flying as a fairly new pilot on the wing of a more senior pilot in South Korea on a training mission. And we're landing at a airfield, but we're in the clouds and snow. So we're being controlled for a uh, instrument approach, basically just coming straight for 10 miles and landing. And when I have what's called a radar altimeter dialed in at about 100 feet to let me know right before we land so I can stop looking at the airplane and start looking at the runway. And uh, we're about three miles away from the airfield and then my radar altimeter goes off. And so, which it obviously never should have. So we immediately break away, hit our afterburner and shoot straight up. And come to find out, we were seconds away from impacting a mountain that was right in front of us. The controllers had forgotten about us and directed us right into a mountain inadvertently. So, again, weather can can cause some serious uh, heartache. Sometimes you don't even know what's about to happen. That's wild. And just very briefly, is there any weather that we perceive as bad on the ground that's actually good to fly in? I would say if there's... Uh, 
you know, fog over land or sandstorms or, or low-lying clouds, th those, those would be great to fly in above that because we have weapons that can get through that without any issue. This is, again, we're talking weaponry and target uh, weather. But, uh, yeah, if we can fly above the weather, the weather below us really isn't a factor. All right. And uh, Commander Pico, we have another viewer question. This one comes from Martin in Alabama. And Martin writes, any advice for aspiring Top Gun pilots? What are the most important skills to have? And what can and can't you gain from training? Wow, good question, Martin. Um, I would say, I mean, you know, that killer instinct, all those things, right? But it, it's, it's more than just that spirit to win and that laser focus to win. It's really that desire to understand what it takes to win something and then doing that. Uh, everyone wants to win, uh, but does everyone want to do what it takes to win? That's the question. Do you have the grit? Do you have the laser focus? Do you have the dedication? And, and make sure it's healthy competition. You know, those are those of us in the military, we all want to be the best. I don't want to be the best and push down my buddy next to me. We all want to go to the top. I just want to be at the very top when we finally get there. So I think those would be the big ones, grit, dedication, and just that laser focus to figuring out what it takes to win it anywhere and do it. And John, do you still fly? What are you doing now? Are you uh, doing other things in civilian life? So I fly a little bit, usually with friends, if they have airplanes, I'm taking a little break right now, spending more time on the boat. So I'm following my other passion, which is finance. And we live down in Key West, Florida. So I run the Edward Jones southernmost branch as a financial advisor down here. And uh, no, life, is, life has been great. Life has been great. Excellent. Excellent. Well, we wish you the absolute best with uh, your next career here uh, in the world of finance there in Key West. And uh, well, uh, it's a pleasure talking to you, Commander John Pico. Thank you so much for your service to our country. We do not take that for granted. And also thanks for your time here today and sharing some of this insight uh, as what it's really like to be a Top Gun pilot. Thank you, Jeff. Appreciate it. Well, likewise. And don't forget, when you have a question about weather, space, or science, you can write us or send us a video question at asktheexperts at accuweather.com. You can also call us at 888-566-6606. Coming up in WeatherWise, we're going to explore some firsts for military aviation when Ask the Experts returns. Welcome back to AccuWeather's Ask the Experts. I'm your host, Jeff Cornish. It is time for WeatherWise, and in this version, we're going to explore military aviation firsts. Some of these are pretty impressive for their time. The world's first military airplane was the 1909 Wright Military Flyer, and this was built only six years after the Wright Brothers' historic flight at Kitty Hawk. The U.S. Army Signal Corps bought a plane the brothers designed for surveillance. It was a two-seater, and it could reach speeds of up to 40 miles an hour and travel a distance, very impressive for the time, of 125 miles. In 1932, the Martin B-10 was the first all-metal fixed-wing bomber used by the U.S. Army Air Corps. Innovations included an enclosed cockpit, an internal bay to hold bombs, and maximum speeds of up to 213 miles an hour. Also pretty swift for that time. Finally, the first Top Gun aircraft was built in 1968. The Grumman F-14 Tomcat was featured in the 1986 movie Top Gun. So the jet fighter with long-range bombing capabilities had a rotary cannon for dogfighting and air-to-air -air missiles able to hit enemy aircraft 90 miles away. The U.S. military retired F-14s in 2006, so Tom Cruise moved on to the F-18s in the Top Gun Maverick sequel. Thanks so much for joining us here on AccuWeather's Ask the Experts. I'm Jeff Cornish. Remember, when you have a question about weather, you can email us at asktheexperts at accuweather.com or you can call us at 888-566-6606. Thanks so much for being with us. Have a great one. <music>